preachers in the body of Christ, my brother, Pastor Jake Filkey in the house tonight, and we are delighted about that. His father, Bishop Mark Filkey, will be with us here in a couple of weeks, and we love the Filkey family here at Christian World. Would you stand to your feet and help me give a real warm San Antonio welcome to Pastor Jake Filkey. Hey, CW! How you doing? Man, I'm so glad to be here. I am so excited to be with my CW family tonight. I have, so, I have such a word of God for you. I have something that's going to lead you to God's promise for your life. The favor of God resides in this house. God is going to grow. God is going to prosper. God is going to increase everything this, hand, this house puts his hand to. I want to honor and respect my good friend, my brother, Pastor Jason Sides, his lovely wife, Pastor Katie Sides. We are foodies together. Whenever we come together, we do we eat a lot of strange things together, and it's one of my favorite things to do. You can have your seat. You can have your seat. I'm so glad to be here with you tonight. Thank you for having me in your house again. Uh, we had such a great time. It's so interesting to see so many of the prophetic words that were given last year have already been fulfilled. We had mentioned, uh, we were driving on the way over, and hey, what's up, man? Uh, we, were, um, we were on the way over, and we saw many home developments that were built, right? They weren't there a year ago. Do you know what that is? That is God bringing people to save to your doorstep. That means you don't drive, have to drive 10 miles to go find them. You can go find them around the corner. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this night. And we thank you, Lord, for everything you've done in us and for us. Father, we thank you for the promise that belongs to us. God, the promise of salvation within our family, the promise of healing within our body, the promise to grow us, to prosper us, to increase us. We thank you for the promise. Now, Father, I pray tonight that I would not be a vessel for my own opinion, that I would not be a vessel for my own thoughts. But Father, I pray that you feed me your thoughts so I can give them direction for their life. It is your will they live in fullness. It is your will that they grow in every part of their life. That is your plan. We don't have to ask for it. We don't have to beg for it. It's already done. So Father, I pray for every believer in this room that have taken the time and they've gotten here tonight. I pray that you speak to them. I pray that you encourage them. I pray that you illuminate them. I thank you for everything you've done and everything you're going to say tonight. We thank and we praise your precious and wonderful name, Jesus. Amen and amen and amen, amen, amen. The power that you felt in this house with that praise and worship, the worship that we did a few moments ago, that same power, that same spirit, that same physical, tangible presence that we felt, you feel your blood pumping you feel a tingling sensation, a warmth, all the stress from your day that's immediately alleviated when you come in the presence of God, that is becoming an irregularity in the body of Christ. What you are experiencing in this body is becoming more rare and more rare, and this house is a precious house. This people is a precious people. These people are, I wrote a book, right? These people are a precious people. Your pastors have a heart for this city. Your pastors, where other pastors are trying to do meeting after meeting, trying to get the newest portion, they're trying to, to fly all over the world and live extravagant lifestyles, your pastors want to continue bringing deliverance to hurting people. This is a beautiful and a holy thing. And we have to understand that this house and this vision is going somewhere. We are going somewhere. Now, let me just say this to you before we go on. We're going to begin prophesying in a few minutes, and I want you to understand what the prophetic is. It's very important. The prophetic is information or a message that God sends from the eternal realm, from the heavenly realm, that is for the purpose of giving you an understanding of his will and his plan on earth. Now, what he does is he speaks through somebody, 
me. He speaks through somebody and he gives him a message specifically for that person for a specific reason, a specific time, and a specific purpose. Now, God does not give you a prophetic word so that you can live in an alternate lifestyle. His prophetic word only leads you to his will. Look at your neighbor and say, his prophetic word only leads you to his will. It only leads you to his will. Now, many times the prophetic message, you know, the, the misconception is that when you're a prophet, you, you, know, you see all the psychics on TV, which is a completely different realm altogether. Um, when you see those things, you assume that when I'm looking at you, that I know what you know, or I've been in that room that you were in, or I am seeing things I'm not. God is giving me things. He is showing me things. I'm expressing those things to you. He's going to share intimate things that only you and he know. And when that happens, that is giving you an indication that God is watching. Now, in, in, in the epistles, the apostle Paul tells the, the, the people of the church, he says, look, I would rather you prophesy to people than speaking tongues. Because then they would know when you look in the Hebrew, it says, then they would know that God is listening. In the Didacte, which is one of the, the earliest writings of the, of the 12 apostles, he instructs them to accept, uh, uh, um, to accept prophets in the home because they bring correction and they bring direction. So when we get a prophetic word tonight, if you get it, I'm not, I have not been looking at your Facebook. I promise. I have not been scanning through Instagram going, ooh, I'm going to get her on that tonight. I've not been doing that. Um, if there is something there, it is because I am seeing something and I'm letting you know it's not for condemnation. It's not for hurt. It is not for God to expose something that's intimate. It is for the very purpose of God saying, look, I'm watching, I'm listening, and I still have a plan for you. There's still a will for you. Does that make sense? Was that, is that understandable? Okay, cool. So tonight, what we're going to call this message, I've got two titles. I haven't decided which one I like the most. Tonight, we're calling this Moving Towards the Promise. Look at your neighbor saying, we're moving towards the promise. Say it again. Say, we're moving towards the promise. I'm so glad you're here, Bishop Sides. I am so glad you're here. Can I give you a prophetic word? Would you mind? Could you stand up? I was praying for you several days ago, and the Lord said something to me. I honor you today. Uh, we, we are the result of, of your hard work and we love you. Um, the, I was praying for you several days ago and I heard the Lord say something to me that the attack that happened a year, year ago was an actual demonic attack that the enemy was trying to remove you so that you could not fulfill the next stage of your purpose. Then I heard the Holy spirit say something that was very interesting that I've never actually heard him say to me before was he said that, that the Holy Spirit does not just heal your body, but the angels of God protect your body. That they are standing guard because there is coming a season where there are going to be many young men that are going to lean on your wisdom and that are going to lean on your sanctification. Your lifestyle and the amount of time that you've lived sanctified has made a sanctification that almost doesn't exist anymore. So when a men of faith that are young come to you, they're going to need wisdom that only God could give them, and he's going to give them wisdom through you. God is going to protect you. God is going to prosper you. God is going to give you wisdom, new wisdom and new insight. God is going to give you prophetic words. You're going to get in the room with some of these young men, and some of these men are going to be highfalutin, and they're going to be, they're going to be traveling around the world and doing their thing, but God is going to give you a specific word to minister to them personally. You're going to stop the attack of the enemy from affecting their life because of your wisdom and because of your guidance. Father, I thank you for Bishop Sides tonight. Father, we thank you for his life and we thank you, Father, for everything you've done in him. The Father, we thank you that your word has already said that you're protecting the man of faith, that your, that your angels stand guard over his body. And we thank you for it. The Father, I pray that you inspire him. I thank you for giving him new energy, new passion, and I thank you for the direction you have him going on. Uh, First Lady Sides, I, I, also the Holy Spirit told me I saw a vision of you walking hand in hand with the Holy Spirit into a war tent. Inside of that war tent, there was a, a, a map that was the plan of the enemy. 
And I heard the Lord saying that he's going to begin to bring you in in a new way and he's going to begin to reveal mysteries to you. He's going to begin to reveal people to pray for that you don't know. You are, you are literally, God is going to give you people to pray for in government. God is going to give you people to pray for in ministry and you will literally see their circumstance change. You will never talk to them. They will never know you prayed. But God will reveal these mysteries and he will show you what to pray for. He will show you strategically what to pray for. And when you do, you will see a change in their life. Father, I thank you for Bishop and First Lady. We thank you for their life. We thank you for their call. We thank you for everything you're doing in them. We thank and we praise your precious and wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. And amen. 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 Um, amen. So I'm going to kind of be everywhere. So if I get a prophetic word, I'm just going to say it. Is that cool with you guys? Do we need to do an altar call? Do you make it feel like it was real? No? Okay, so, so we can just do it. Okay, so listen. So tonight, it's either called, uh, I'm, I haven't decided. You guys tell me which one's better. Moving towards the promise, or this is my other title, son, my son, nothing prospers in Egypt. Get in your word, and I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1, and we're going to start there. Did everyone bring their tablet tonight? Did you bring notes? I want you to take notes real quick. Fantastic, awesome. I want you to write this down. This is, a, this is something that you need to know. Write this down. My promised land is all of my family being saved. Say it again. Let me say it again. My promised land is all of my family being saved. All. Not some, not a few. Now, not Aunt Nene, not just Uncle Bobo, all of my family being saved. My promised land is the deliverance of that son or that daughter that are bound by some addiction. My promised land is being made whole in my body, a complete healing plug $10 back at the store. My promise is God prospering and growing everything I put my hand to that is within his will. The Israelites had a bit of a quandary because though they were God's people, they, though they, they had the blood, the bloodline of kings and queens, they were emerging from Egypt and they were now trapped in a slave mentality. They were trapped in a mentality that kept them from taking the promise, from understanding the promise. It kept them from seeing the promise that God was making, had made to them and walking forward. And every time you turn around, Moses was arguing with this group and Moses was arguing with that group and God has to wipe out an entire generation, the generation that comes out of Egypt. God has to wipe them out just so the new generation will see the promise that he had made and believe and trust that he will do that promise. So they had a, they had a quandary because even though God had freed them, I mean, they had seen miracle after miracle. I mean, they had seen water turned into blood. I mean, think about that. I mean, you're out, you're out fishing in the water and all of a sudden it becomes red and turns into blood. They had locusts, they had frogs, and, and there were all these crazy things that were happening one by one. I mean, in one single night, God removes, the angel of death removes an entire firstborn generation of an entire nation in one night. They're seeing miracle after miracle, and yet they're in a challenge because they're having trouble connecting the fact that what was happening yesterday is not what God wants to do tomorrow. And they were having a challenge in their mind and they were having a challenge in their faith because mentally they were slaves. But in the desert, they were experiencing the greatest miracles to humankind. I mean, how many in this room have ever eaten manna before? None of us have ever eaten manna. And the Israelites lived on manna. I mean, literal bread from the bakeries of heaven, which I'm believing is Krispy Kremes, was falling, was falling from heaven. And they were eating it. 
Moses speaks and hits a rock and water comes out of a rock. That is scientifically impossible. Yet they were experiencing miracle after miracle. You will experience the most amazing miracles in what seemed to be the desert of your life. What seemed to be the most challenging moments in your life, God will bring miracles from them. They were born as Egyptians, but the heir to a promise that was beyond their ability to gain on their own. The ability to gain this promise could not happen on their own. They couldn't figure out on their own. They were were a people that forgot how to fight. They no longer had a military. They no longer had a history. They didn't know where they came from. I mean, you see the new writings, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, those are all written by Moses. There are 400 years of missing history from, from the Israelites. They have a missing history. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they come from. They don't know how to fight for themselves. They don't know how to watch out for themselves. They don't know how to prosper. They barely know how to farm. And yet God is providing for them and God is increasing them and God is, is prospering them. Number one. God prepared the Israelites for the promised land in the desert. God prepared the Israelites for the promised land in the desert. He didn't prepare them in Egypt. The things they learned in Egypt did no good for them. They were slaves. All they knew was being bossed around. All they knew was poverty All they knew were being enslaved to somebody else. All they knew was murder. All they knew was rape. All they knew is all these horrible things that the Egyptian culture had. That's all they knew. Yet God was saying, I have a promised land for you that is filled with milk and it is filled with honey. It is filled with fullness and it is filled with prosperity. It is filled with peace and it is filled with happiness and fullness. I have a promised land. I'm trying to take you there. I'm trying to move you there. I'm trying to get you there. In the middle of the desert, God was preparing them. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to read a little bit tonight. I hope you're ready. Now, this is the commandment. The statues and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all of your days and keep all of the decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. I'm giving you command. I'm giving you direction so that you fulfill the entire mandate and the entire mantle and the calling that is on your life. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well among you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey As the Lord, your God of your descendants has promised you living a life of faith produces multiplication and it produces prosperity. Living the life that God has ordained for you to live, the life that God has called you to live, produces multiplication and produces prosperity. I was listening to a book by a lady who is a, a, her name is, uh, she's a financial advisor. She's very famous. And she was saying, she was talking to us. She lives a completely different lifestyle than what we believe as believers. And so she was saying, listen, she goes, I don't understand why, but she goes, I have figured this secret out. When I take 10% of everything that I gain in business and I reinvest it into a nonprofit organization All of my finances increase and grow. Now, this is an unbeliever. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, you're 6,000 years late. We've been doing this for a minute now. We are still coming into, I was reading another study where it was talking about how when they found, when they were looking at people that were depressed, they all held certain attributes. And one of them was the inability to let go and to forgive. And I'm thinking to myself, well, Jesus said, 
that if you forgive, I will forgive you and your father will forgive you. There are things that the world does not know that we know. And God gave us those principles so that we can live a life that multiplies and prospers. When God gives you a prophetic word, it only leads you to his will. A prophetic word will never lead you away from his will. Let me give you an example. A young lady came to me and she said, Pastor Jake, you gave me a word that I was going to find my husband. I said, yes, I did. And I'm praying, Lord, don't let it be me. And I, and I said, I said, Lord, I said, she said, you said you would, you would, uh, you know, you would, God would give me a husband. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, I think I found him. And I said, wonderful. I said, have you brought him to church? She said, no. She said, we're moving in next week. And I said, well, then he is not the will of God and he is not the plan of God for your life. This day to this day, she has had several children outside of the bounds of marriage. She is on welfare. She is not doing well because she was following her flesh and she was not following the prophetic word that was given. Another lady came to me and she said, hey, listen, uh, you know, you gave my daughter a prophetic word about prospering that she would have influence. I said, fantastic. And then she said, what's that? Oh, she said, what was that guy's name? Um, she goes, oh, and, and she is prospering. I said, great. I said, what is she doing? He said, she is a, a, a booty dancer for little Wayne. And I said, that was not the word. That was not the word. The prophetic will only lead you to his will. So if God says, if God says that a great revival is coming and you will be a part of it, what God is saying is he is going to save all of your family so that they are within the revival that God is going to do through CW. When God says that he's going to prosper you, God is not saying he's going to prosper you just so that you can buy a new, a new BMW. God is saying that he's going to prosper you so that you have the ability to fund what the kingdom is doing and needs. Uh, I believe God for business so that I can give. I don't believe God for business so that I can buy a new car or so I can do this or that with it. When I say God prospering, I say God prosper me because God, we need new bathrooms in our church. God prosper me so that we could put our fence up. You know, in fact, the first lady, my mom, she was, uh, she was, she was, she was talking to me. She said, Jake, the Lord spoke to me. We got to start building a fence. I was the first one to pledge 5,000. You don't got to ask me if God said it. You don't need to hand me an envelope. God prospers me. The reason he's given me prophetic word after prophetic word after prophetic word is because he knows that I'm going to walk in his will with it. He only gives you the prophetic. He only gives you something that's going to lead you to the promise. More challenging things that we have to do as believers is we have to learn how to come out of the mental place that we're in, where we have to recognize that yes, there were a group of people that we were connected with two months ago, but they may not be connected to the vision anymore. There may be a group of people who we knew back there and it was great back there, but today they're not here. And so because they're not here, they're no longer a part of what CW is doing and the direction we're moving. And it's difficult to let go of stuff. And you say to yourself, man, you know, Pastor Side used to speak in tongues so many more times during services. And I, I would go to CW more if he would speak in tongues so much more. And, you know, Sister Katie used to jump at least seven times every service. And when she would jump seven times, I would feel the power of God. And so because she's not jumping seven times, I'm no longer going to do that. Or, you know, brother, pastor, you know, Bishop Sides walks past you and he's busy. He's got a lot on his mind. He doesn't shake your hand. You're like, oh, my God. You know, 10 years ago, he would have shook my hand. And I guess I guess I'm just not in right standing with the sides anymore. I I just don't connect with the sides anymore. What we were 10 years ago is not who we are today. The promise is still the same. The direction is still the same, but we are going somewhere. We are moving towards the promise. Um, there is a, the gentleman who sings uh, behind Bishop sides. Yes, sir. Tori. Like frittata for Tori. Okay, nice. Okay. I am a foodie. 
Okay, stand up, sir. If I could pray for you. Now, we talked about you today. I'll tell you that, that straight up. I'll t- we talked about you today. Your pastors love you. They're so proud of you. But um, what I want to say to you is what I saw. I saw the word increase, that there are a lot of things that you're involved in, but God is bringing even more increase to you because God has found you to not just be favorable, but he has found you to be trustable. That he has found that when he not just supplies the need, but when he puts something in your hand, that you always make a way that you seed back into the house that feeds you and it's you seed back into the house that makes you who you are. I also saw the word government contract, government contract, government contract. There is a deal that is coming or a number of deals that are coming that are much larger before you kind of had to work it like you had to hustle. And you had to like work this in, work that in, work that in. God is going to begin to shrink those possibilities down. And he's going to begin to expand few ones that are going to produce more for you. I see you traveling more. I see connections to government in Washington, D.C. There are things that God is going to do in you because you have been made favorable and you have never left your post. Easy to leave. Easy. Easy to leave. Everybody has a good reason to leave, but it takes a strong person of faith to stand your ground and to move forward. And you are you have stood your ground. You have found favor in God's sight and God's going to multiply you. God is going to increase you. Amen. 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 So. There is nothing for us in Egypt. I think this is the challenge with Facebook. You know, they keep doing these studies and they're finding out that the more you go on Facebook, the more um, depressed you get. The more you go on Instagram, the more depressed you get, the more frustrated with your life. I mean, I look at all my friends and they've got the, the Norman Rockwell life. I mean, they have these, uh, they're, they're going, it seems like they're going to the beach every day, which really what they did, they took a thousand pictures that one day they went four years ago and they're posting the same ones with different filters. And, and you look at these pictures and you look at this life and you see your friends, you see your friends out and you see the people around you that aren't in church, that aren't connected, that aren't in the will of God, that are are not doing the things of God. And you look at their life and you say to yourself, man, is all the work I'm putting into this is all are all the steps that I'm taking to move forward, benefiting me. And I have one thing to say to you. There's nothing for you in Egypt. There's nothing for you five years ago. There's nothing for you 10 years ago. There's nothing for you back there. There's nothing for you at the parties. There's nothing for you in the stranger's bed. There's nothing for you in a marriage that's not in the will of God. There's nothing for you in a poverty mentality. There's nothing for you in Egypt. And sometimes we get caught up and we're like, man, but it used to be, or, oh man, it used to be. You don't remember the the nights where you cried yourself to sleep. You don't remember the frustration and the difficulty that the enemy was allowed to pursue in your life. Because when you think of it, you may have good thoughts or you may have good memories, but there's nothing for you back there. Everything that you need is forward. Everything that you need is moving that direction. It's not looking behind. It's looking forward. It's not looking at who in this. It's saying, God, what direction do you want me to do? What direction do you want me to go? We, have, we get so caught up and they were getting so caught up because they kept getting they kept getting messed up because they was so hard for them to get out of it in their mind. Spiritually, God was moving them. I mean, spiritually, God was God was performing miracles in the desert. So they were going the right direction. They were moving the right direction. But mentally, they were having trouble getting out of this mindset and getting out of this place in their head where they were insecure and they were frustrated and they didn't know who they were and they didn't know what direction they were going and they didn't know why God was doing this and why God was doing that and why God was using Moses, but why God was not using Aaron. And they had argument after argument and they were frustrated and being frustrated, having arguments because they were having trouble in their mind. 
Yet around them, God was performing these miraculous, these amazing miracles. And if you will walk forward and you will move forward, this is what God is saying to you. God is saying that I'm trying to teach you a way to think and a way to live that will prosper you. Let me say it again. He's saying, I am trying to teach you a way to live and a way to think that will prosper you. How I thought two years ago doesn't work for today. It doesn't work. How I gave five years ago, five years ago, putting a hundred dollars in the bucket was a big deal. It was like, wow, hundred dollars. That's like 10 McDonald's meals, you know, five years ago, I was like, dang, a dollar on iTunes for a song. Who can I afford at this pay period? What I did, well, how I thought five years ago is not how I think today. Now drive dropping five is no big deal because God has changed my mindset. The people that I had, there's a friend of mine who, who I didn't drop him. I hate to say drop him. I just, I stopped hanging out with him because, because it got to the point where I'm like, bro, you're like, you're, you're treading water and you're not really moving forward. I'm going this direction, bro. I'm writing books. I'm traveling. I'm ministering to people. I mean, every day I'm bringing Christ to everybody I come in contact with. I mean, I'm doing all these things, bro. Like your biggest deal is when you're going to have a party on your birthday and you're, you're out drinking every weekend. And I sat, thought to myself, I said, man, that was good 10 years ago, but today that doesn't work because God is trying to prepare me for something bigger and better. For all of you white people out there, I did not say bigger and better. I said bigger and better. Look at your neighbor saying, God is prepared. Bigger and better. God is prepared. Bigger and better. God is trying to prepare you in the desert. God is trying to prepare you in times that seem tough. God is trying to prepare you because if he prepares you now, it will sustain. God forbid God saves all of your family at once and you're not ready for it. God forbid that God heals your body and that next Saturday you're in the the, the club bumping and grinding. God forbid that God gives you the lottery and you win the lottery and then you struggle with returning your tithe. He is preparing you in this place so that when he gives it to you, when he gives you the bigger and the better, that you are ready for it and that you will sustain in that prosperity. That when that son gets saved, when that daughter gets saved, you're going to know what to say and how to treat them. And you're going to know how to minister to them. This thing that we're living is a lifestyle. There are three people in the room. You've been having issues with your heart. One person you've been having issues with the left ventricle. I see left ventricle. One person this week, you went to the hot, you went to the doctor this week. They're saying that they're, they just want to keep putting you on medication. Are there three people here? You've been having issues with your heart, specifically one person. Yes, ma'am. Can you come to the front? One person specifically, I keep seeing the word left ventricle or I see it. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. All right. Hi, how are you? I'm Pastor Jake. Who are you? Who are you? Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Nice to meet you. We pray over you. Father, we speak to this body. I need a, a, a female to come to the front, please. If you could put your hand on her chest where her heart would be. Fantastic. Okay. So, Father, we pray over this body right now, and we speak your word. Your word says in Romans 8 and 11 that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ the dead will quicken her spirit and will restore her mortal body. 
we pray that God, you will restore and you will heal her heart. I know what the doctors have said. I know what science says, but I thank you that we speak to the great physician. I, th I speak to the one that created her heart and I command every molecule. I command every cell to align with your word that says that she is healed and made whole. I declare it and I thank you for it. And do this thing in her family she's praying for. God, she, this, is, this is not just about her heart. Father, do this thing in her family she's been praying for. God, it seems as if it seems as if there is no hope. And there are people in her family that if something does not happen soon, there is no hope. But Father, I pray that you would supernaturally get involved. That God, you would speak to the right people. It almost feels like there's like a tangle up with like paperwork or something. That God, you would speak to the right people and that you would get them through. That you would get them supernaturally work things out for their good. Thank you for it, and I praise you for it. Now, I don't know what that means, but God, I thank you for it, and I praise you for it. In your precious and wonderful name, Jesus, amen, amen. and amen, and amen. Tell me what that means if you do after service, okay? I'd love to know. Awesome. Being a believer is not about, there is no such thing as a, there is no such thing as a Sunday believer. One time I had a guy tell me, and I was talking to him about the devotion of God and how devoting yourself to the church and devoting yourself to the plan of God and the will of God in your everyday life produces prosperity and produces a full life where people in the world struggle with things. When you look at the studies, many people in the Christian church don't struggle with a lot of the things that people in the world struggle with because we have the presence of God in our life, and that's a daily thing. So he said to me, he said something very interesting. He said, Pastor Jake, he goes, here's the thing. He goes, on Sunday, I'm in it 100%. Sunday, 100, I'm in it. He goes, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, that's family time. But Sunday, I'm in it. You want me to help in the nursery? I got it. You want me to help, you know, uh, you know security? I got it. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, that is time for family. So you just can't count on me those times. Let me tell you something. There is only such thing as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday Christians. There is no such thing as halfway. If you're moving towards the promise, you've got to put everything into it. You have to move everything into it. So if I say something like, I'm going to give you a prophetic word that say, say, I give you a prophetic word that God wants to heal your hip, for instance, because I feel there's somebody here with the hip issues. If I say that God is going to heal your hip, the last thing that you need to do is increase the medication. You need to begin walking and saying, God, I thank you that you've healed my body. Thank you, God, that I have to use this leg to minister to people. I have to use this leg to walk into places and bring healing to people's life and bring salvation. When, uh, when I was having issues with, um, and this is in my book, when I was attacked physically, one of the things that the Holy Spirit spoke to me was he said, the healing of God belongs to you. And when I heard that, I began to thank God. And so I told the enemy, I said, I was ironing my clothes, and I told the enemy, I said, listen, if you think that this is going to stop me, now that I know what you're trying to do, I said, Go ahead and try to make sure I don't go to church. I said, I will, I will blog every day of the week. And I said, then take my fingers. I said, I will make videos every single day of the week with my nubs. <laughs> then I said, take my voice. I dare you. I will erect the largest white screens you've ever seen. And I will write out everything I was meant to say. The enemy wants to stop your purpose. He wants to stop you from gaining the things that God has ordained for you to gain. Your son's salvation belongs to you. I'm saying that for somebody. Your son's salvation belongs to you. Your daughter's salvation belongs to you. But will you walk towards the promise? Will you keep taking step after step? after step, or will you just give up? It's so easy to give up. 
It's so easy to get caught up with what's going on around us and, and, and not know what to do. And then we just give up. But we have to continue moving towards the promise. Number two, write this down. You will not build it, but God will give it to you. You will not build it, but God will give it to you. Just like this gentleman's shirt right here. I didn't buy it, but he's going to give it to me. That's a joke. You will not build it, but God will give it to you. Here's proof. I'm driving in. You didn't have to ask the city for permits to build a, a, build a, a large housing development. You didn't have to hire the contractors to bring the people to you to come to your church. You didn't have to ask for funding from, from investors around the world to give you the money to build homes to bring people to your church. You didn't build it, but God brought it to you. In your word, Deuteronomy again. <coughs> Deuteronomy again. We're going to be looking at verse 10. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land that he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to you, I, I give to you, a land fine, large cities that you did not build. Think about that. That God caused kings and queens to build buildings for the purpose of giving it to the Israelites. That God knew the wants and the desires of the Israelites and caused other men and women to build it so it pleased them. Think about that. Houses filled with all sorts of good things that you did not fill. Hewn cisterns that did not hew, that you did not hew, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. I will, he's going to create a, not a drop a hundred dollars on you one time, but he's going to create a system that's going to sustain you for a long period of time. He's going to give you buildings that you didn't have to build. He's going to fill cisterns. He's going to fill bank accounts and prosperity. He's going to fill those things up and you didn't have to work for it. He's going to cause other men and women to build and start businesses and to build systems of blessing. And then he's going to plant you in a place where it prospers you. And when you have eaten your fill... Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The Lord your God shall, you shall fear the Lord your God. Him shall you serve and by his name alone shall you swear. There's a level of fullness that you have not experienced yet. And this is the problem with, with, with coming out of something and being in the desert yeah. is there is a prosperity that we're unfamiliar with. There's a joy that we're unfamiliar with. There's a peace that we're unfamiliar with. There's a prosperity that we're unfamiliar with. Look at all the people. Go do the studies of all the people that win the lottery. They end up going bankrupt several years later. Because they weren't prepared. They were still living in the trailer in the trailer park. And they weren't prepared for the mansion. They weren't prepared to invest the money. They weren't prepared for the bank accounts and the lawyers. They weren't prepared for it. There is a level of prosperity and there's a level of fullness. This level that I'm talking about, mind you, and remind you. This is the salvation of your sons and daughters. Many of you, if God did it right now, you may not be able to handle it. You may not be able to do it right now. You may not be able to handle how to talk to them right now. But when God brings you to that promised land, he's going to give you the wisdom and the faith and the prophetic edge to minister to them as a person of God, not just your family member. But what if I told you, what if I told you that your God 
could save your son without one single conversation from you? What if I told you that God could heal your body without one single pill? What if I told you that God could give you a home that you didn't build and you couldn't afford 10 years ago, but you could afford tomorrow? There is a level of prosperity that God wants to bring us to that is outside of the way that we were thinking five years ago. It's outside of the way we were thinking even a year ago. And God is moving us a direction and God is causing us to move that direction. But we have to change the way we think because he wants to drop a level of prosperity, a family salvation of healing within our body with a prosper uh, uh, where he blesses everything we touch. He wants to drop it on us and he doesn't necessarily want us to work for it. But it takes a whole new level of thinking, a whole new level of prayer. I can't even tell you how much I enjoyed song service tonight because I, I go to places all the time and it's getting to the point where I'm going and the presence of God just doesn't show up. It never shows up. And people get up and sing and they wail and they've got the lights and they've got the smoke and they've got the dancers and and they got I mean, they found the best looking people in the church and they turned their mic off, but they look good singing. <laughs> You know, I went to a church. No joke. I went to a church. I went to the sound booth and all their mics were on mute, all their mics, but they look good. I mean, they look good. I mean, they look good. I'd marry any woman. I mean, they look good, but they were not interested in the presence of God. They were interested in an image and they were interested in feeling all the seats in their church, but they weren't interested in, 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 in filling the church with the presence of God. And so there is a level of prosperity that God wants to bring into this house that is unfamiliar. And so one of the things that had happened was that the, the, hmm, tell a story. There was a lady that she was having an issue in her organs and they could not figure out, they were doing all these different tests on her organs. And, um, I feel like I need a tap dance right here. Um, <laughs> It's like, I automatically just feel like I need to. Um, so they were doing all these tests on the organs. They could not figure out what was going on. And uh, she was gaining a lot of weight and it was like water weight, but she was gaining. It was, it was getting to the point where it was affecting a lot. It was just, she was getting sick. So she was in an altar call one night and, and my dad got up and, and laid hands on her and told her what it was and said, God is going to heal you tonight. God is going to restore you tonight. God is going to do something supernatural tonight. And she went home and uh, she had a doctor's appointment the next day and they went to the doctor and she could not figure out what had happened, that everything that was going on before was no longer going on now. Right? But this goes back to, this goes back to what will you do with it? What will you do with it? So then after that, within a few months, we weren't seeing her on Sundays because she was partying. She had lost a bunch of weight and she was looking good and she was doing her thing. And next thing you know, on, on, she wasn't making it on Sunday because she was partying all night on Saturday. And then the next thing you know, on all of her social media sites, you know, she's posting this with this guy and posting that with this guy. And, you know, the Bible says you can't judge a man's heart, but you can judge someone by their fruit. And so what had happened was God did the miracle in her life, but she wasn't ready for it. There was a level that God was trying to bring her to, but when he finally did it for her, she wasn't ready. And so she went right back out and, and it's so hard to see stuff like that because she's no longer a believer anymore. And because she was not ready for the blessing, look at your neighbor and say, where are you ready for the blessing? Say it again, say, are you ready for the blessing? Okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to stay here for a second. I got to stay here just for a second. I got nine minutes. Um, what will you do when God supernaturally saves that husband that you've been praying for for 20 years? How will you respond? 
What will you do when God fully restores the body that has been aching and the body that has been ailing for 15 years? What will you do with the provision that he'll give you from crazy supernatural in crazy supernatural ways? I mean, there have been people that I have known that they they were living on the streets. I mean, they were living in. I mean, if you live on the Stockton streets. You are down and out. She was living on the Stockton streets and, and she came in and we were praying over her and investing in her and, and believing in God in a moment. Some guy she had never met died. First lady sides. He died. She never met him, but she was related to him and she was the only relative left. Dropped two point five million dollars in her bank account within a few months. What will you do with God's blessing? What will you do with your time? You say, God, I want more time to serve. And he gives you that time. Will you show up early to make sure that you can open the door for people? Will you show up on a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night, a Thursday night to have a meeting with the kids, the kids ministers? When they ask you to serve in the TV ministry, will you drop what you're doing or will you go, hey, man, I just served in the in the parking lot on Sunday. I need to get fed, too. What will you do with the fullness of God? What will you do with the blessing of God? What will you do with the promise? I'm going to hit one more vein because it's painful. When God blesses you abundantly, he doesn't just bless you just for you. He blesses you for the kingdom first. First. Look at your neighbor and say, first. When God blesses you, he does not just do it so you can buy the Prada shoes. He does not just do it so you can buy the newest iPhone. He doesn't just do it so that you can take that vacation to Hawaii you've been praying for. He's doing it because there are needs in the kingdom and there is a way to sow. And every step you take is one step closer to the promised land. Every time you show up and it's hard, everybody gets tired. Sunday morning is everybody's day. Am I being too rough? I got all serious, didn't I? Everybody is tired on Sunday morning. Welcome to being an adult. Welcome. Everybody is yawning at six o'clock on Wednesday. Welcome to being an adult, a human being. Everyone is tired. I had a lady come to pass that you just don't understand. I was at work six hours today. (laughs) Fantastic. Welcome. That doesn't mean you can't open the door in the front. What does that have to do with anything? Have a cup of coffee and call it a day. What will you do with it when God does it? We have to be ready for it. Some of the greatest things that we'll ever experience will will happen through with us being in the desert. Here's what the cool part of this whole thing is. When the spies went into the land, they were astounded by the blessing. They couldn't believe it. They went in And they were just expecting, you know, they had gotten the word of the Lord and they're like, oh, this is going to be cool. There are vineyards. They didn't know there'd be vineyards with grapes the size of basketballs. They were like, cool, there's going to be milk and honey. They didn't know that it was literally overflowing. There was too much milk and honey in the land. And it says the spies, when they brought it back, they had to have several guys carry one bushel of grapes because there was so much there. Every step you take towards the promise, God will prosper you more and more and more and more. The people you know that have that have done their thing, you know, my my buddy, he always goes, you do you, you know, those people that are the you do you people, they're not going to prosper like you are going to prosper. They're not going to increase like you're going to increase. God is not going to bless you the way that he's going to bless you because you are actively moving towards the promise. Faith is an action. It's not a thought. Look at your neighbor and say, faith is an action. It's not a thought. 
None of you are gurus in this room. So this idea that we can send these positive thoughts in the universe and things are going to happen, that's a bunch of bad stuff. That's a bunch of stuff. But for those that walk it out, to say to, say to themselves, you know what? I'm going to show up to youth and I'm going to, I'm going to minister to that young man because one day somebody's going to minister to my son. That faith that says, okay, I see that girl. She needs help. I'm going to take time with her. I'm going to pray over her until God delivers her because one day that's going to be my crackhead daughter and the altar getting delivered. That faith that says, God, today I'm sowing 150, but tomorrow I'm going to be sowing a thousand every Sunday. Every step we take, every move we make, the healing in your body, every time you get up and say, oh man, I'm sore, but thank God I've got breath in my lungs and thank God I can move and thank God I can get to church and I can help usher and I can help sing and I can help do things in the kingdom. And you walk that healing out until it happens. They were astounded by the blessing. God's promise belongs to you. Look at your neighbor and say, God's promise belongs to you. Say it again. Say, God's promise belongs to you. Would you do me a favor? Would everyone join me here in the front? Let me take time. Let's pray together. Everyone join me here in the front. If I could have music that makes everybody cry, that'd be great. I'm a PK. I make smart all comments about everything. Amen. Amen. Join me in the front if you would. I know it's scary. It's scary. So scary. Amen. Amen. Everyone, if you could lift your hands up high, come on, just lift your hands up high. Sir, sir, everyone just lift your hands. Come on, just this quietly. Keep hearing this in my spirit. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I've come.